Good morning. I know I'm on a little early, but I wanted to test a couple of things here just to make sure everything's working the way it should be. So give me just a minute. Thank you to the folks that are going to be joining me today, and thank you for everybody that's going to be watching in the, in the replays later today. Appreciate you. Looks like Mr. Bob Beal is on. Good morning, sir. Let's make sure we're set up here. Let's see. Yeah, 12 folks joining us this morning. Good morning, everyone. If I look like I'm dressed to do farming work, then that's because that's what I'm going to be doing today as soon as we get done with coffee with Rich. So that should explain that. Let's see who's on. Will is on in Montana. Man, I hope I get to see you this year, Will. I'm looking forward to getting up there, hopefully in August. Jeff is on. Good morning, sir. Uh, William is on. Good morning. Gene is on. Josh says, rise and shine. Bob Bell, good morning, Rich. Good morning. Robert Gayhart, good morning. Warriors, coin number 1401 from Northern Kentucky. Happy farming, Rich. I appreciate that. Got to sharpen up my hose, get the weeds out of the garden. And all that good stuff. So 19, 20 people on now. Please like and share before we get started. I got a really good show for you today. You know, a lot of times on Coffee with Rich, I talk a lot about gear and gadgets and things of that nature. And we talk about the hardware that uh, we warriors use. Well, today, I'm going to talk about the software and the software between your ears specifically. Yesterday, I was trying to decide what in the world am I going to talk about Coffee with Rich. And I said, you know, I have never really talked about leadership and its importance and my thoughts on it and so if you want to stick with me today with a, a little discussion about leadership i think it's important right now as the world and our country specifically is going through some crazy times that we have a discussion a little bit about what what is what is a leader and what is the priorities of a leader so i'm going to give you the top 10 things that i think are important you can do with it what you will and i will tell you that if you just listen to me this morning as you're driving or working or whatever you're doing or watching. And then I'm going to turn this discussion into an article that you can find on AmericanWarriorsCited.com. So if you miss some of it, you'll always have something to go back to. And this list is as imperfect as I am, man. I'm missing a lot of stuff, but trying to condense a career uh, in the Marine Corps down to the top 10 leadership things that I saw good, bad, and indifferent, and give you some food for thought. I thought that uh, thought I would try to share that with you. Let's, before we get started, let's see who's on. Please like and share. Brett Parker is in, surrounded in Southern California. Wow, yeah. Kevin Park said, hi, Rich. Jeffrey Young says, good morning, Rich. Coin number 1614. Mm, God bless you, man. Brett says, good morning from Southern California. Coin number 1668. David Frazier, good morning, sir. David, I need to get you on here, man. We need to talk uh, trauma medicine. So let me put that bug out there right now. Mike Ballard says, good morning from Dallas. Sean says, good morning. Terry says, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 24 people on. Please like, share. We're about to get started. So what makes me think that I'm qualified to talk about leadership? <clears throat> well, I've, I've led at all different levels in the United States Marine Corps, attended a lot of different leadership courses in the Marine Corps, was president of at least two different academy classes that I went to. I ran a leadership academy at Paris Island, South Carolina for years, put through a lot of students there discussing leadership and all its facets. I actually had an article published in the Marine Corps Gazette on uh, making ethical leaders, and that article is now required reading at the University of Michigan's NRTC program. So they're still using a document that I wrote 10 or 12 years ago, and they, they make their new students read it, and they have to write an essay on this article that I wrote. So pretty cool. So I'm maybe a little bit qualified to give my two cents. So thank you to the 32 people that are on this morning. We're going to get started. Here we go. The first one I would tell you is periodically conduct an audit on yourself and your team. And I know that sounds kind of kind of lame to start off with. Like the first thing you got, Rich, is conduct an audit. Are you kidding me? Well, it should be done immediately upon taking over an organization. And I'm going to tell you, I learned this the hard way. Um, I took over an organization in Louisville, Kentucky as the operations officer. 
didn't conduct an immediate audit. A couple months down the road, I find out that I'm missing some critical things that I should have had from the very beginning. And I felt like I let my team down, I let myself down. So um, this is one of the most important things you do when you take over an organization. If there isn't an audit and not everything will have one, <clears throat> then what I would encourage you to do is have your subordinates sit down and think about what is their job, what are the tasks needed to create that job, and you guys author your own audit. Um, it's important because that sets expectations for what their billet is required to do in order to accomplish the team's mission. And lastly, I'm looking at my notes here. Your organization may have specific tasks and implied tasks. It, it, and here's important because every job has a specific task. We've got to bomb this area, okay? I'm using military metaphors. If we have to bomb that area, an implied task is we need to be able to get on target. We need to be able to GPS our way to the target so that we can drop those precision ordinances. We need to load the bombs. We need to arm the bombs. So there's a lot of little implied tasks along the way. And I would also tell you to the 39 people that are joining me here that it, you need to let them know what you value and what you don't value. And be very specific. I'll give you a case in point. I made it very clear to my folks when I took over, like, look, I, I'm not impressed with how many pull-ups you can do. The Marine Corps sets a standard. As long as you can meet or exceed that standard, that's all that I'm interested in. What I'm really concerned with is one, two, three, X, Y, Z, whatever was important to me. So they need to know that so that there's no ambiguity. I think that's important. Let's talk about the second thing on my list. Now we got the, the, the uh, weird admin stuff out of the way. Know yourself and seek self-improvement. And when I talk about that is you need to try to kill your ego, man. And, and I'm going to say that, but let me also caveat it with, <clears throat> never forget your ego got you to the dance. Your ego and your drive to excel is probably what made you a leader. And it, I say it got you to the dance. Like, you know, I, I didn't, I joined the Marine Corps because I thought it was the most elite organization. That was, that's ego talking. That was my little 19 year old ego that said, I want to be part of the best. But then once you get inside that organization, you got to take that ego off and, and be able to learn. One of the things you need to do is give yourself the Myers-Briggs topology test. <clears throat> you can check this out at Human Metrics. There's also a lot of other psychological instruments that you can find for free on the interwebs. And I encourage you to do that because you need to understand by understanding yourself, by knowing yourself and seeking self-improvement, it's going to inform you of some of those cognitive biases that you probably have implicitly and just don't know it. It's also not a bad idea to give the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs Topology Test, or some other psychology, psychological instrument to your employees or to your team because it will help you shape how you deliver the message. And I'll give you a case in point. I, I hired a group of uh, Myers-Briggs people to come in and uh, to my Marine Corps unit and give everybody the instrument. And then we had them put a plaque on their desk that said their four-digit code. So like I'm, a, I'm an ENTJ. So I'm extroverted, intuitive, thinking, and judging, okay? That's my quick personality makeup. But not everybody sees the world like I do. So some of my guys were ISFJs. That's what my wife is. So they're sensing and feeling. So when I talked to them and I ha had that placard up there for a month, I would look at that placard and I would know that they're probably someone that feels more. So I might use that kind of language because what the intent of it is, I want to be able to better communicate to them so that we can accomplish our mission a little bit better. Um, the bottom line on this one is about knowing yourself and seeking self-improvement is if you are a, the best version of you, I think your people should be better people for having worked with you or for you. Okay. So before I go on to number three, let's see who's on here. What folks are saying. Donald Green is on. Gerald is on. Leadership traits and principles. Absolutely. You're going to see some of those in here this morning. Not all of them, but definitely some of them. John is on. Robert Rand. Good morning, sir. Dan Mueller, 1968 coin number. Hey, Sydney is on. John is on. Mr. Doug Lightfoot is on. Good morning, sir. John Jacques. Good morning. Bob Bill says he is an INTJ. I am not surprised by that at all. Mr. Mike Sieglander is an INTJ. That's the scientist. So uh, I'm not surprised whatsoever. Brett says, truth, I took over 
took over an armory and the same day I discovered two rifles missing, I was able to report accurately that the present status was. Then I eventually found the rifles had been sent out for repair, no paperwork left behind. If you only have one opportunity to make a good first impression. Yeah, spot on. So again, please like and share. Let's talk about number three on my top 10 list. Set the example in all things. Never, ever, ever, ever compromise your integrity to lead. Your moral authority to lead and hold others accountable is one of the only things you have. So you can never surrender that. Um, your, your ability to lead and hold others accountable must be beyond reproach. Leadership is often a lonely, lonely place, as they say. You know, as a, as a chief warrant officer and the command, I was a company grade officer, but but also at the same time, I'm the most junior company grade officer. So like I'm even below lieutenants, but I'm also above sergeant majors. So I'm in this lonely little world of, I can't really have any friends. And that was tough. But the moral high ground is expensive real estate. It means that you don't always get to go to the club when your guys go out to the club. It doesn't mean that, it means that, uh, it means a whole host of things, okay? So set the example by taking time off. I think this is one of the most important things a leader does is show the, show the guys that as long as we're making mission, we can enjoy time off. There's nothing wrong with that. If working 80 hours a week doesn't impress you, make sure your people know that because they're going to be trying to impress you. And the often misconception is, oh, the boss is here. We need to work late. Well, I try to let my guys know, don't confuse time in the office. Don't confuse time in a uniform sitting under government paid for fluorescent lamps with getting the mission accomplished. They are two totally distinctive things. Now, another thing I would tell you is on setting the example is you don't get to violate any of the company rules or any of your rules. RHIP was something in the Marine Corps, you know, rank has its privileges. I don't, I don't believe that. Um, leaders should eat last, period. You should always be putting your people before yourself. Leaders eat last. This is a thing we had in the Marine Corps from the time I was a sergeant at the School of Infantry. My boys got to eat first. I ate last as an officer. That was just, that was just the way we rolled. And if there wasn't enough food when we got there, there just wasn't enough food. But you never want to take food out of your boy's mouth, period. Um, lastly, your example should be, this is a critical one. We only get paid for the results, not our efforts. No, the efforts don't pay the bills. Results pay the bills. Don't forget that. Make sure your people don't confuse effort with results. Very important distinction. Another interesting little book on discussing that one is Who Moved My Cheese? It's an interesting little book if you haven't read it, but uh, pretty neat stuff. Let's talk about number four, then we'll take some comments. Thank you to the 35 folks that are on. We're going to talk about leadership lesson number four. Don't punish your team for making mistakes when they're trying to make your mission and execute your intent. Back them. Only punish them for not learning from those mistakes. I say you want to punish something? Punish timidity. Punish immorality. Punish lying. Uh, punish Ruthlessly punish ethics and morality violations. <clears throat> and I think one of the ways that you can inoculate your team against timidity is to create an, a climate with a bias for action. Um, but having a bias for action doesn't mean running through the door to get punched in the face. That doesn't do anybody any good. So while I love decisiveness, I'm also telling you be deliberate with your decision making. And realize mistakes are going to happen, man. They are absolutely going to happen despite your, your best laid plans and your team's best efforts. But I would encourage you to give your guys the freedom. And I'm going to talk about this in just a second. A leader will make you feel safe to learn from those mistakes. Just don't tolerate them making the same mistakes twice. And I say this because one of the biggest things for me as a leader needs to, needs to make you feel safe. If I'm running around feeling fearful, whether it's fearful from him being capricious or this person I'm working for, you know, one day this is important, the next day that's important. He's, this guy's all over the roadmap. I, I, you know, he's punishing everybody here for, they're trying to make mission. They're trying to do the right thing. And every, every time they step slightly a toe across the line, they get smacked. There's no way to live. So uh, make your people feel safe that they can make a mistake here. It's okay. Be aggressive. Be ruthless. Um, but we only get to make that mistake once. And one of the ways that you can do that is 
when mistakes are made, let the people that make them come up with the TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, the SOPs, the standard operating procedures, create a process, create a habit that ensures those kind of mistakes won't happen again. Because one of the most important things that we do within an organization is um, we want to achieve consistent, predictable, desirable results. And I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that I did recently with this uh, on a team that I was leading. We kept getting these results that were kind of all over the map. And I it kind of phrased it to them one Friday morning for training. I said, what if there was a way that we could create uh, standards where we would always have predictable, resi desirable results? And I walked them through a Lean Six Sigma exercise where you take two two by fours and like some bowling balls and we get them to roll a certain distance and that's what the cu customer pays for. Anyway, I, it, I had them learn heuristically that if you, if you write down every part of the process and then you calibrate your little two by fours, the bowling balls will roll to the same spot every single time. So, and we eliminated waste. But my point is, it was the only way I could get it where the light bulb went off. Lastly, your employee handbook and other written rules should serve as guardrails for your team. They need to know where their left and right lateral limits are. Uh, once again, I think that helps them feel safe. Like I know specifically, this is a hard line for Rich over here, and this is a hard line for Rich over here. Anything outside that's not gonna be tolerated, but inside this, I have the freedom to do whatever I need to do in order to accomplish my mission. Make sense? So before we get to number five, let's see who's on here this morning with us. Mr. Michael Seeklander is on. Mr. Michael Seeklander, we're talking about the software between your ears this morning. We're talking about some leadership things. And if you're just joining me, again, like I, like I said from the very beginning, I was a director of a leadership academy at Paris Island, South Carolina. I've had some uh, leadership things that I wrote published in the Marine Corps Gazette. Matter of fact, one of them is still being used by the University of Michigan, ROTC. They have the new students read it and then write an essay on it. And this was something I wrote probably 10 or 12 years ago. I've went to a lot of leadership schools. And last night I sat down and wrote down my top 10 things that I think are important for a leader. So here we are. Jacko says, Rick, how are you guys doing? Doing good, Jacko. Hope you're well in South Carolina. Uh, Donald said, stingy with fault, generous with praise. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Jerry, good morning, brother. I'm out there in Montana. Alan Kelly is on. Donald Green is on. Let's see. Good morning, TC. Will says, LDO, Chief Warrant Officer, finest of the officer community, greatest accomplishment in my career. Yeah, Will was a limited duty officer in the United States Navy, very similar to the Chief Warrant Officer program, but different. Okay, number five on our discussion this morning. Take responsibility and give authority. You can delegate the authority to a subordinate to accomplish the mission, but you must retain responsibility for the outcome. Never blame a subordinate for the failure. Give them the commander's intent and then give them the authority to plan and conduct the operation. You can and should be involved in this. I'm not saying it's completely hands off, but it, but it should be minimal. I'll tell you that. Lightly touch the steering wheel. Be there for the brief backs. And once you've blessed off on that mission, you own it, baby. You own the outcome. You can't blame a subordinate on it. And um, the one of the things that this does is it gets buy-in. You know, once they have written their own plan and they're executing their own plan, they're going to be more bought in to the plan. Now, one of the things I said in there was commander's intent. This is a very important concept. Uh, th there's a great case in point. I went to uh, a general, there was a general officer symposium and this old general gets up in front of us, Marine officers, and we're all in the base theater. And he says, he shows a slide of Vietnam and he says, this is the terrain. This is the number of Marines you have. This is the situation on the ground. The North Vietnamese Army is coming in to attack. You, young officers, have been put in charge of this ammunition dump. It has, let's say, 400 million tons of explosives and bombs and things of that nature. You've only got one platoon of Marines. How are you going to defend this ammo dump? Because your mission is make sure this ammo dump does not fall into enemy hands. The commander's intent is that not one round of this should fall into enemy's hands. That's, a, that's the mission. Keep it from them. Commander's intent at all costs. 
So what ended up happening was, and this is a real thing, and none of us officers got it right because we kept trying to solve the tactical problem. The tactical problem was we'll string up Constantino wire, we'll set up claymores, I'll take my guys and do this, and we'll create call for fire and uh, FPS, final protective fires along the ridge line. That's all crap. You've got a platoon of Marines and several division of NVAs are coming. You do, don't have enough bodies. But remember the commander's intent. The commander's intent was that that does not fall into the enemy's hands. So what actually happened in Vietnam was they rigged the explosives, all the ammunition, 400 million tons or whatever it was, and they blew it up on the way out. <clears throat> and they destroyed hundreds of millions of dollars worth of government tax dollars by destroying the ammunition dump, but not a single thing got picked up by the enemy. So that's why it's important to know your intent. What is your intent? You know, sometimes it's take the bridge. Okay, cool, take the bridge. But the in order to statement, the commander's intent may be in order to deny the enemy from crossing from north to south across the bridge. I say all that because I've seen instances in history where the, the unit will seize the bridge and then watch them build a pontoon bridge less than a click away and then tr cross from north to south. Well, dude, that was your one job, not necessarily to take and hold the bridge, but to stop them coming across. So if they cross at another place, you, you've just failed. Number six, you must be proficient and demanded of your team. But most of all, you can't lead people to accomplish a task that you can't do and or don't fully understand. Case in point, let's say they put you in charge of the motor pool or in charge of the forklifts, and that's your new thing. I've seen this myself. And you need to know how to drive a forklift. You need to know how to maintain a forklift. You don't need to be the best driver of the forklift, but you need to know how they're maintained. You need to know the standards in order to give someone a forklift license around here. Um, you need to understand that. And, and I will tell you, when it comes to be proficient to manage your team, it starts with recruitment, man. If you recruit a bunch of idiots, then guess what? You just created your own problem. And while we're talking about team, this is the way I look at it. I want a team full of A players, period. A players lead and they get rewarded handsomely. All B players should want to be A players. That should be their job because they see how well the A players are getting treated. Every B player's chomping at the bit to take that A player's job. C players with promise are trained and encouraged to be B players. D players are uh, uncovered and aggressively removed, period. And there are no room for anybody else. I want A players, I'll accept B players that want to be A players. C players get groomed and try to make them B players. If they can't move up the ladder, they're gone. And D players are uncovered immediately and aggressively removed, period. So anyway, like, share, please. Uh, before we get into number seven, let's see who's on and what folks are saying. Give me some of your things you've seen good leaders do or not do. And remember, I'm dressed like a farmer this morning because... I live on a farm and I'm going to be farming just as soon as, as soon as I jump off this live screen. Uh, let's see here. Donald says, always loved serving under Mustangs. Yeah, you know, I, I was a gunny for years before I became an officer. So I had f almost five years as a staff non commit as a staff sergeant, and then two or three years as a gunny. So I had, gosh, what, seven years plus as a staff NCO before I became an officer, and then it was like starting over at the bottom. And I will tell you, when it, let's go back to that kill your ego thing. This is one of the things I loved about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I get out of the Marine Corps. I'm a chief warrant officer in charge of this kingdom of the Southeast United States, including Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And I'm kind of a big deal. Then I go and work for the Red Cross, and I'm in charge of the state of Tennessee. And again, I'm kind of a big deal. I got volunteers all over the state. I'm being asked to speak at these uh, conferences all over the country, and it's pretty cool. And then I become a white belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I'm getting my butt kicked, and I'm having to mop the floor like I'm a teenager again working at McDonald's. That was one of the best damn things that ever happened to me. One of the things that I didn't think I would one of the things I didn't know that I needed was that humbling of coming back down to reality. Strap that white belt on as a 48-year-old man, because I've been doing it now for about three years. Strap that white belt on, get crushed by some people younger than me, have to sweep and mop the floor at night. It was amazing, and I loved that. I love that aspect of it. Let's see what people are saying. 
Let's see. Jocko says, my commander always told me when every task I might be responsible, but he will remain accountable. Yeah, great. Strategic versus tactical. Yeah. Brett says cross-trained generalization versus special specialization. Yeah, absolutely. Specialization is for insects, somebody once said. It's all about being a generalist. John says, good morning. Like your shirt. Have the same one. Yeah, thanks. Got good taste. Uh, yeah, hoping the list will be posted. Yeah, I mentioned that at the beginning. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this list and turn it into a, a post on the American Warrior Society dot com. Uh, so that right now you just listen to me and enjoy it and interact with me. And then later, if you want to go back and read it, you can do that. Doug says recruiting is the hardest and one of the most crucial tasks that we need to do in law enforcement world. Today's environment proves that. Boy, spot on. Recruitment is critical. If you hire a bunch of turds, then guess what, man? You can't make chicken salad out of chicken poop, right? All right, let's see what else we got here. Number seven, keep your people informed. Communicate. Communication and information must flow through the organization in all directions. Anytime you find somebody that, no, nobody can see this. This is my little piece of the puzzle. You can't get access to this information. You're, you're gone. You know, and I've seen people do that at all levels from Lance corporals who think their job is important and they don't want anybody to know it to very senior officers that would were stingy with information or sergeant majors that I'm trying to figure out why this recruiting station is failing and we're sending in all these assets to them. Meanwhile, the sergeant major knows the personnel problem is that the guy's going through a divorce or his kid is sick or got cancer. That's all relevant. I need to know that so that I can help this person. Um, when it comes to keeping your people informed, man, number seven, they must be told what the mission is, but not necessarily how to accomplish it. I had a colonel one time who, he was a, a tank commander and led the charge into Baghdad. He was the tank battalion commander. And then I worked for him when he was a colonel. And one of the things he would always say is, hey guys, I'm not going to tell you how to suck eggs. You're a Marine Corps officer, figure it out. Uh, I, I knew what he wanted to accomplish. And I had all the resources and tools to accomplishment and his blessing on how to get that done. Let them devise the solution to the problem. This will make them more bought into the execution and its outcome because they're executing their own plan. So of course they're going to like it. And I will tell you too that when you allow your people to do this, you're going to be astonished by how creative they are. And they'll look, look at the problem in ways that you can't. And this especially is important in the profession of arms where the propensity for uh, lethal force to be used on them or others is, is obviously there. If you're planning an ambush patrol, guess what? It's premeditated murder. So when I taught at the School of Infantry how to ambush, how to conduct an ambush patrol, it's how to conduct premeditated murder, how to patrol to a set point, set up an L-shaped ambush, design your kill zone beautifully, and then let, let the bad guys walk into it and get, get slaughtered. But let your people do that. Uh, give them all the data that they need to make timely and accurate decisions. This is best done non-verbally through creating a system um, that stresses whether it's charts or alerts on your phone or whatever it is. Give them that information instantly, non-verbally when they need it, but also encourage verbal communication amongst your team. And while you're creating a, a climate of rapid decision maker making, ensure that you the leader are making timely and accurate decisions. But like we said in the beginning, not the kind of decision where you run into a room, and get punched in the face. I, won't, I think a leader should be decisive. I think a leader must have bias for action, but I think you need to be incredibly deliberate with your decision making. Um, I'm never gonna let anybody force me into a decision. And I learned that the hard way. Uh, I had a commander who was like, I was a brand new officer and I was all gung ho about making mission. And he finally was like, hey Rich, I'm not gonna let you rush me, man. I'm going to take a walk around the block and I'm going to think about it. And I'm going to come back in here and give you a decision. And if we miss the time hack, we just miss the time hack. I don't care about that. And he was, and, and it was a great example of, I was presenting him with, I have crap for you to eat, sir. As your operations officer, this COA A, course of action A is eat this crap. Or you can COA B, you can eat crap with broken glass in it. And he's like, well, no, I'm going to choose COA C. I'm going to take my time, think about it. And let's see how the situation develops. Great learning lesson for me. Let's see who's on here and what they're saying, and then we'll go back to, uh, we got eight, nine, 10, we're almost done, and then I can get my gardening on. Let's see, Jesse Ross, what do I, I see, let's see here. 
Will Parker, bad news does not get better with age. Never be, never be the senior man with a secret. Man, that is so good. Never be the only person with a secret. If I, if I or one of us can go to jail or court, I need to know. Yeah. Speaking of that, Will, you bring up a great point, and that is I need to know. So any organization that I've been over, I always institute, I have a big poster size thing that says Commander's Critical Information Requirements. These are things I need to know, and they're the priority which I need to know. And let's say the first thing might be, and these are the things that you need to wake me up in the night. This, this stuff cannot wait till tomorrow. I got to know now. Let's say number one might be the death of one, of one of the guys, somebody in the team, a death of them, their spouse, or immediate family member. Wake me up. I need to know about it. Anything doing with dealing with law enforcement, wake me up. I need to know about it. So there, there's a hierarchy of these things. Commanders in uh, critical information requirements, things that you need to push that information to me immediately. And then there's stuff that within 24 hours I need to be notified, um, or within 72 hours I need to be notified. So great point, Will. Thank you. Clint is on. Good morning, Clint. And I were in the Marines together. He was a, a brother officer there at Sixth Marine Corps District. Good morning, Clint. Um, Brett says, don't over-discipline, must have creativity to resolve problems themselves. Micromanagement kills. Boy, that's true. One of the things they always said about Donald Rumsfeld when it came to the GWAT was he was the 13,000 mile screwdriver, meaning he would always try to reach in and tinker with stuff, even though he was back in Washington, D.C. Okay, we got a few more things to go on our leadership lessons this morning. Number eight, ensure assigned tasks and priorities are understood, well-led, and accomplished. And when it comes to this, is this is something we talked about in recruiting. We had something called the Kukumu, clear, complete, mutual understanding. I, me and you both have a clear, complete, mutual understanding of the assigned task, the priorities, and then it, subordinate leaders need to make sure that they're well-led and accomplished. One of the things that was hammered into us in the Marine Corps uh, uh, leaders is accomplishment of the mission is always number one. Troop welfare is number two, and we're going to talk about troop welfare in just a second. But never lose sight of the fact that uh, your job, leader, is mission accomplishment, period. So a lot of people will say, well, then what is the definition of leadership? And one of the things I heard was getting things done through people. That's leadership. Although that, that definition seems a touch incomplete to me because it also doesn't necessarily, it can create a leader that will drive you and smoke you and you might get the mission accomplished, but it's not necessarily a, a consistent, repeatable process because he just crushed you to get it done. But I will tell you, you know, don't let your leadership turn into micromanagement like we talked about. And how, and how you do this is you create a climate of decentralized leadership by giving them the mission or the task, your desired end state, which we talked about a second ago, any implied task, and then holding them accountable to it. Now, remember, accountability should never, ever, ever be a negative word. If you've ever been rewarded for your performance with a shiny uh, medal on your chest or uh, an attaboy or maybe a raise or a really good performance appraisal, you were being held accountable to your, to your actions. If you ever got fired... If you ever got laid off, uh, you were also being held accountable. I'll say all that to say rewards are part of accountability. On the topic of decentralized leadership, this will allow your subordinates the flexibility to rapidly, without your input, capitalize on successes. One of the things in the Marine Corps maneuver warfare doctrine is you'll have two maneuver units up front and then maybe one in the reserve. So I always looked at how does a leader use their reserves? This is important. So if I have two companies in the attack or two platoons in the attack and one in reserve, do I use that reserve when somebody's getting their butt kicked? Or do I use that reserve to capitalize on successes as they appear? And I would tell you my position is I capitalize on success because like in maneuver warfare doctrine, when you hit a surface with your maneuver element, you look for a gap and you exploit that gap. So again, you need to be able to foster a team that operates well when the radios are off. And this is what I'm talking about. This is actually one of the things that I wrote about in my article, a leadership article that's now still being used at the University of Michigan. And that is, 
How do we create a climate of ethical, moral decision makers that can make the right calls and then ruthlessly attack the mission uh, when the radios are off and they can't seek approval from higher headquarters? One of the ways you can do this is um, you don't ever want to create your own chaos. And I'm going to come back to that. That's a, that's a whole chapter unto itself. A leader should have the mental, moral, and emotional flexibility to thrive on chaos. But again, you never want to create your own. You're going to get enough friction in this world without creating your own. Nor should you tolerate a subordinate that creates chaos within the team. One way to ensure we don't create our own chaos is to keep all things simple. Keep it simple. Additionally, the mission and its end state should be crystal clear. There should be not a bit of fuzziness as to what mission accomplishment looks like. And we're going to make this extremely simple. If there's too much complexity in the plan, Murphy will happen and your best laid plans will fall apart. There's a couple of different ways I want to talk about this. I'm going to talk about creating chaos and clarity of mission. Creating chaos. So I go to pick up my son one day from school and the school lady that lets students out, that's her only job. There's me and a few other parents and I see parents hanging out and I, and I go to, to sign the book to get my kid out. And she's like, what are you doing? Like I sign in the book, yeah. Like it says on the little placard here, says, parents sign in. She goes, no, you can't do that until a bell rings. I'm like, okay. So me and the parents are looking at each other. And we wait 10, 15 minutes, a bell rings to change classes. And chaos goes off. And all the parents come up to sign in. And students come flooding through the door. And the, the teacher who created this rule is sitting behind the desk just pulling her hair out. She goes through this every time the bell rings. It's absolute insanity. Um, but that's her, that's her thing. That's the way she's created this system. And then she's running around for five minutes just in complete bedlam. And then the next 55 minutes until the bell rings again, she's got nothing to do and she won't let anybody front load the problem. It's absolute insanity. But that's what I mean by creating your own chaos. Let's talk about clarity of mission because this is important. When it comes to clarity of mission, um, one of the things I've seen is Let's say that our job is to waterproof this boat, okay? And me and you are out there, we've got our caulk guns and we're putting silicone caulk because we're gonna take our little canoe and get on the water tomorrow. If I asked you what you were doing and you said, I'm caulking this boat, I would say stop. Because what you're doing is waterproofing this boat so we don't drown on the lake. And sometimes I think we get lost in the minutia of a task and not think about the big broader thing that we're trying to accomplish. Um, so think about that. And this also ties back in to, to the issue of do we safeguard this ammo and die trying and fail and let the enemy take our dead bodies and the ammo? Or do we blow the ammo and run, just like we talked about earlier? Number nine, know your people and look out for their welfare. Thank you to the 49 folks that are still joining me this morning. Two more leadership lessons to go. After this ninth one, I'm going to look at your comments. So if you've got some leadership things that you've seen, Please throw them out there. And again, all this will be available for you on American Warrior site later today when I turn this into its own article. Know your people and look out for their welfare. Number nine, knowing your people might mean knowing their wives and kids' names, their favorite colors. Mike Seaclander's favorite color is blue. Their favorite food, sports team, etc. But it also might mean knowing their boot size or their gas mask size or their blood type. It might also mean, you know, uh, Looking out for their welfare, let me say it this way. Looking out for their welfare doesn't mean you should be giving them donuts and coffee every morning. But what it does mean is that you eat last, and we talked about that a moment ago. It also means you give them the... This is, what, this is where I think uh, troop welfare is. A lot of people, you know, we talked about rule number one for leaders, mission accomplishment. Rule number two is uh, looking out for your troops' welfare, right? Looking out for your people's welfare. But I think a lot of people think, well, that means I need to give them a pat on the head every morning and give them donuts and coffee and tell them how important they are and give them little kick kisses on the cheek. Here's what I think it means. It means that um, you give them the absolutely the best training and equipment to accomplish their mission. That's the way I think troop welfare is. Looking out for their welfare might mean rewarding them publicly and often. It might mean removing cancerous people that they shouldn't be working around. People that have been getting in their way of making mission and getting things done. You're the only one that can get rid of those folks, man. That's why it's one of the most important things you do is 
performance evaluations, appraisals, conducting that audit up front so that you know what they should be doing. And when they're not doing it and they're that D player, you get rid of them. So that that way the team is surrounded by these meat eaters that want to get stuff done. Um, but anyway, knowing your people and looking out for their welfare, yeah, you need to know them inside and out. You, I should be able to walk up to you. What's, uh, what's Ken's wife's name? What's his two, two kids? Are any of them playing musical instruments? You need to know this stuff. But you also need to be giving them the best training, the best possible equipment, hold them to that standard, and hold everybody else to that standard. So that when you see somebody drop them below, you try to fix them, they're not going to get there, then they need to find somewhere else to work. All right, let's see what folks are saying here. Thank you to the 41 people that are on with me this morning, and thank you to all those that are watching replays. Let's see. Robert, good morning. Let's see here. Doug Lightfoot says, spot on. In, mo in most cases, I walk to discipline. I don't run to it. Only exception is when a criminal law violation is alleged or a person presents a danger to themselves or others. Spot on. Robert Gayhart says, one of the best things you can do in leadership is to give the answer to the why question. Why we perform certain tasks or why we make certain decisions is important. Information that's follows. We all get annoyed with the do it just because I told you so. I think as adult learners, you know, one of the things that Mike and I teach in the Firearms Instructor Development course is the what, why, how. What we're going to do as far as during this period of instruction, what it is, how we're going to cover it. We're going to cover it via lecture and we're going to go to the range and do some live fire training. That's how, but why. Let's talk about why we do a magazine change and, and then we'll solicit from the class, etc. So you're absolutely right. The why, again, falls idea of commander's intent. We call it the in order to statement. Take the bridge, IOT, in order to, this is the desired end state that the commander's trying to get out, and that is the why. Mike says, be nice to see Coffee with Rich hit 100. We almost did one day, or maybe we did. I think we got 106 one time. Robert Thornberry says, a person's most accountable to themselves. If I don't hold myself accountable, why should anyone else? Well said. My first answer to most situations has always been blow it in place. <laughs> yeah. Terry Thomas, this has great, much appreciated. Yeah, you know, we talk, like I said at the beginning, a lot of times we talk about hardware here on Coffee with Rich or we do an interview, hardware being the gears and gizmos and gadgets. But every now and then I think we need to stop and talk about the software in between your ears. So we're fixing to get to number 10. Thank you for staying with me here for 40 minutes. Um... Instructor, sign up for the FIDC course. Yeah, next month uh, we've got the Firearms Instructor Development course. If you want to attend, check out shooting-performance.com and come out and train for a week with, with Mike and I. All right, number 10, the last one. Prioritize and ruthlessly execute. You and your team must know what the organizational priorities are and the order of those priorities. you got to put them like this is the most important thing and these are the uh, subordinate things to that. Everyone must know them and ensure that they're deliberately and ruthlessly executed in the correct operational timeline. So one of the things that we would do is take, you know, like on the battlefield, we would break the, the, the attack into phase lines. We're crossing phase line Budweiser. And let's say we've got, we've got to be across Budweiser 0400 in order to hit phase line cores by 0800, whatever. And then we might have en route rally points that we can meet up with and communicate, make sure everybody's still good, get a head count, and then attack forward. But you have to know what the priorities are and where those priorities uh, fall out within inside the timeline. Because it, in some regard, it doesn't do any good. Well, I, you know, we did it. Yeah, but you did it two days too late. Good job. All right, so that's the top 10. We'll go through them real quick just to, just to close this thing up here. Number one, periodically conduct an audit. Number two, know yourself and seek self-improvement. Kill that ego, but never forget that ego and your own personal vanity may have gotten you to the dance to begin with. Number three, set the example in all things. If you can't teach your boys how to climb the rope if you can't climb the rope yourself. So you have to be able to set the example. Don't punish your team for making mistakes when they're trying to make them to accomplish your mission, number four. Number five, take responsibility, but give authority. Number six, 
You must be proficient and demanded of your team. Number seven, keep your people informed. Number eight, ensure assigned tasks and priorities are understood, well-led, and accomplished. Remember, nobody gets paid for efforts. We only get paid for results. Number nine, know your people and look out for their welfare. And number 10, prioritize and ruthlessly execute. And that has been some leadership thoughts that I kind of scribbled together last night, put it on a Word document, and I'll put it in an article today for you. Whew. All right, folks, hope you enjoyed this show on the software in between your ears and how some of the things I think about leadership, having spent a lot of my adult life in leadership roles, both on the humanitarian side of the house with the American Red Cross, doing disaster relief and leading those operations and then leading in the United States Marine Corps. So anyway, anybody got any questions for me? If not, I've got some stuff to do on the farm here. Gerald says, lots of material that should be promoted, Thomas. You know, one of the things that, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I thought about doing this show today is our nation's really hurting for leaders right now. We really are. Uh, look at what's going on with this Chaz zone in Seattle where, you know, they're allowing this kind of stuff to take place. It's absolutely unacceptable. And we, as taxpaying, law-abiding Americans, we need to be screaming from the rooftops about it because it's absolutely unacceptable. Noni says, excellent show, Simper 5. Brett says, thanks for sharing. Great example of leadership. Well done. Um, Paul says, excellent, thanks. Jeff Brown says, Rich loves the word try. I'll tell you real quick, I absolutely don't accept the word try. I, I took over a new unit. One of the things that um, everybody kept saying this T-R-Y word, we're going to try to get it done. We're going to try boss. We're going to do all this stuff. So finally, I ripped that page out of the dictionary, crossed it out and nailed it to my door and said, don't, don't come in here and tell me we're going to try. Now, the reason these guys were saying this, this was 2005. Marines were coming home in body bags, and I was the recruiting operations officer. We didn't have enough guys. We had 39 sectors in the state of Kentucky. Nine of them were open, didn't have the recruiters. The com commandant of the Marine Corps had come back from Iraq, and he had tears in his eyes when he said, I don't want to hear about how hard it is on recruiting. The New York Times were reporting that the United States Marine Corps was missing its recruiting mission for the first time in, like, decades. So we're failing, and all I'm hearing is that everybody's going to try. So one of the things we did is like, what's the problem? Well, you know, anyway, we don't try. You, you only get paid for your results, not your efforts. But, yeah, so I don't let my kids say the T-R-Y word. I don't accept it. Say you're going to attempt it. Say you've got a plan. I get it. You may fail, but I think tr using the word try is a built-in cop-out device because you can always come back and go, well, I told you I'd try. No, I want you to tell me you're going to do, you're going to execute, ruthlessly execute. And if you fail and come up short, I'm going to help you. We're going to teach you. We're going to train you. We're going to give you better tools. We're going to give you better assets. But I can't teach hustle. You either have it or you don't. So thank you, Jeff, for giving me that tangent to go on. Gene says, great show. Gerald says, thanks. Terry says, truth. John says, great stuff, Rich. Thank you, sir. Robert said, thanks for the talk. Sorry I came in late. Catch up. Thank you for being on. Brett says, excellent. Doug says, awesome show. I would love to talk leadership with you more. I'm constantly seeking to improve my leadership. Be watching the show again. Yeah, and take a look at the article. Again, this isn't perfect. I could probably come up with 100 different things. But to kind of compress it into the 10 that I think are probably some of the most important. And again, there's nuance to every one. You can't just have the heading. It's, it's kind of fuzzy underneath it. And I kind of dig down into it in the article that I'm going to have up there for you today. Folks, thank you to the 40 that have been joining me this morning. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Don't normally do these kind of talks on Coffee with Rich. If you like this content, let me know, and maybe we'll do more of the software in between your ears kind of discussions. Um, Kevin says we need this subject matter more often. Thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah, uh, it was pretty cool putting it together last night, sitting on the front porch with my laptop, and just kind of thinking about some of the things that I've seen done right, done wrong. And when I found out the University of Michigan was using a paper that I had published about leadership, you know, to teach their incoming folks about what it is to make ethical leaders, I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Maybe there's something to these lessons that I learned along the way. All right, folks, thank you so much. For, I'm going to let you get on with your day, I promise. Have a wonderful Friday. Have an incredible weekend. Stay safe and remember, the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>